This is John Reed and Brian Summer at Planful Perform, but I want to just do a little ESG gut check because you're about to go. Uh, you have a little wardrobe malfunction there, Brian. I, was, I, I caught my jacket in the right. back of the well, seat. We, we got to we got to make sure that that's. Sorry, we're having some wardrobe issues for Brian, and he's speaking, so he's got to be spiff here. Mm -hmm. So ESG, you're going to be talking to us a bunch of like finance and planful customers around ESG, right? And you you've written a, a recent book on the ESG playbook. So where are we? To, what are you going to be saying to these folks? What what's your message? Well, let me give you. Let me back that up a moment. Um, I actually spoke to their customer advisory board. Uh, I don't know six eight months ago or something like that, and. Uh, apparently it hit such a, whatever nerve, uh, with so many of the folks there that they put pressure on the planful people to have me here and talk at the, uh, user conference. So that's nice. kind of the genesis of it. Um, in between when I spoke and now a couple of things have changed in the world. And one is the securities and exchange commission, uh, approved in February, a whole bunch of, um, requirements. And in ESG language, it's called scope one and two. It's all your uh, direct emissions and indirect emissions that you buy from like public utility companies who give you your, you know, your electricity. That you have to now report if you're a U.S. publicly traded firm. And while some people think, oh, well, I don't need to pay any attention to that. But the reality is, yeah, you do. Because some of these companies need to collect this information from suppliers and transportation providers and so forth. So even if you're not a big company, you may be getting phone calls, emails, and everything else from your customers and suppliers who are looking mm -hmm. for you to provide that data. And I think, you know, and th that also is just the tip of the iceberg from what you have to do, with what's called scope three, where you have to dig down, way down into your, all the levels of your supply chain to find out, do you have suppliers who are using forced labor and all those kind of things? So I'm going to, I'm going to have to talk today quickly about some of the basics that I'd maybe covered with the advisory board just to get everybody on the same page. Then I'm going to update it and talk about some of the new things that are going on right now since I knocked out that book. So uh, this ESG deal, love it or like it, it's a, um, it's a public speaking bonanza for me. But Evidently. It, it's, it's been interesting to watch how Many vendors have shied away from this topic, I believe, for the wrong reasons at the wrong time. And I, I understand a little bit of the rationalization around like, oh, this is political. It's a hot potato. We don't want to alienate certain people and stuff. I'm starting to lose patience, Brian, on a couple different levels with that. But one of the reasons I'm losing patience with it is that these are practical regulatory concerns for companies, especially those with international footprints. And I just don't see why how putting your head in the sand and oh maybe a partner will develop something because we you know we don't want to like talk about it i don't see how that advances your cause sorry you know what's interesting every organization that i approached when i was doing interviews for the book i never ran into one of them that didn't want to talk uh what was interesting is uh, i think most listeners would be stunned to realize how many amazing kind of R and D and innovation things are going on in companies who are, um, who they're not fighting the changes. They kind of can see the writing on the wall. This stuff is, it's way more, uh, regulated in Western Europe, particularly Germany right now. But when I talk to companies, they go, okay, on the record, they'll talk to me about what they have to do to complete regulatory filings, but what it's what they're doing in their R and D labs and their skunk works, um, building management companies are testing these films that they can apply all over the exterior of a building that not only can, uh, they can either reflect sunlight so it keeps the buildings cooler or they generate electricity or they do both. Uh, there are, uh, there was a company that makes cooling equipment and, uh, for, they had a 12, 15 year plan where they want to get the cooling efficiency to be, uh, to use 70%, uh, less electricity and make these things super efficient. Uh, and right now they've already achieved 70% of that goal and they don't talk about these things because it's a competitive advantage for them. So I, um, I think there's a disconnect between a vocal group of, uh, 
politically minded individuals versus what the society in general and what a lot of companies are working on privately. And whether you want to talk about it or not, it's, you know, that's their call. But uh, it's not, it, I've never run into a hostile reception when I've talked about this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think one of the really interesting things you documented in your HD playbook was this, you know, this overdue pursuit of really integrating this into like both the transactional software that enterprises use mm -hmm. and also the planning and analytics software, right? So that it's, you know, you have this new generation of vendors that are thinking about this as like a, 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 a continual thing, not an annual report right. that you file and, oh, this software helps me to file my public reports and due diligence. Now it's all about like this much more fluid thing of like, oh, I might want to switch suppliers quickly because I just learned about that they have exposure in this region or, right. or, you know, I, you know, I want to, you know, you think about, you know, what I think about a lot that I think is persuasive is dy dynamic management of power grid stuff, right? Where you might want to switch to different sources of power all the time and then track that or even compare maybe eventually quote unquote AI will make those switches for you based on some, you know, pre-configured options or whatever. The point being like, what gets interesting is how this is going to get integrated into everything and not just be, oh, let me just read your sustain interactive sustainability report. Oh, my God, you know. So anybody in technology, you've seen this movie before. And, that, and the movie starts off, you know, on a gigantic uh, room with a, a massive IBM mainframe in the 1950s or 60s. And the only thing that you could run through there because of all the limitations were a few summary bits of information about accounting transactions and you, and it still took all day and all night to process that stuff. Well, over time, things got faster and we could capture a few more extra elements. But what happened is companies got frustrated that they were always dealing with old batch data and they wanted real time. Yeah transactional kind of information. Then what happened after that? Then executives got frustrated again. We want to have a forward-looking kind of stuff built on the actual. So we want not just batch. We want it real-time. We want instantaneous. We want it predictable and everything else. And we're going to see the same thing on the ESG side. I mean, yeah. you know, th that right now, the information being collected is already a year old when it's being reported. Yeah. It's it's ancient in terms of the kind of information you need to run a modern corporation today. And it's also uh, often highly aggregated or highly averaged. And a good example of this is a lot of companies, they can't really tell you what their carbon emissions are for transporting goods across the ocean. All they know for sure is, well, it probably go, went through this one lane, uh, you know, common shipping lane. And the average, uh, you know, kind of, you know, diesel consumption per container load was X. Well, the problem is it's not down to the weight of the container or the specific route it actually took. So you don't even have actuals. You're, you're working with kind of rough order guesstimate kind of stuff. And that's going to change. That's going to change. I mean, we have all the technology. We have the sensors and everything else. We have the capability to populate massive data lakes. We can do all of this. It's just going to take the discipline and a few leading companies to really take, take hold of things and embarrass the daylights out of their competitors, basically. That's mm. what's going to trigger the change. Indeed. All right. Final wrap question on the ESG. What do you think is the most likely question you would get from these finance folks today from your talk? Mm -hmm. Some have questions about where can we get some help? Um, a lot of public accounting firms said they were going to hire a hundred thousand people, whatever in this. And I'm just not sure that the help they're going to get is all that good if they get it at all. Uh, so I think I may get that question on the help. Uh, the other one is, um, isn't this something that accounting can fob off to um, legal or the chief HR officer or somebody else? And, that, and I'm going to have to tell them no, because ESG is effectively a team sport in a lot of companies. 
because it touches almost every discipline in the company. Mm. So everybody, you know, supply chain, logistics, transportation, mm. that's manufacturing. A, that's a tough love message for these folks, Brian. Ouch. Well. But that's what I, you specialize I, I don't in. Have to, I may not have to answer that question. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, yeah. But, you know, you asked. You yeah, know, no doubt. No doubt. All right, folks. Well, that's your preview. Even if you weren't able to make it to the lovely environment of San Diego for this, you you got your ESG fix. Thanks, Brian, for that. Mm -hmm. And let's wrap it up and get you on your way. Thanks, John. Talk to y'all later.